In the face of a conflagration, literally appalling in its destruction, that began in this city at 12.30 p.m. yesterday, it is yet, of course, impossible to state with accuracy the amount of loss or the insurance. The plans of the city, as prepared by the city surveyor, shows that 180 blocks were burned up and a part of one other block. The estimate of residences to the block in the residential district of the city is 10, and in the business section of the city, the blocks were built solid. Leading businessmen, insurance men among them, estimate the total loss of the property at from 10 to $15 million. This is as near correct as could possibly be arrived at this hour. It is feared, in the first place, that several lives were lost, and it is known that thousands of people are homeless, bereft of all their earthly possessions, except the clothes on their backs. It is known that the flames, beginning in the northwest section of the city, in the Cleveland Fiber Factory, corner of Beaver and West Davis Streets, ate their way in a wide belt in a generally easterly direction, as far as the Duval Street Viaduct, laying in ashes hundreds and hundreds of residences, public buildings, and business houses. In the beginning, the flames were confined to a few houses in the neighborhood of the Cleveland factory, but a brisk warm wind from the northwest fanned them, and they spread from house to house seemingly with the rapidity that a man could walk. When the writer reached the scene, eight to ten houses in the neighborhood between Ashley, Cedar, and Beaver Streets were burning. People in the houses on the eastern side of Cedar were taking furniture from their houses, although at that early stage of the conflagration it was not dreamed that it would not soon be checked. But it was not. The incredible speed it spread continuing to widen its devastating line of march. By 2.45 o'clock, the handsome residences of T.V. Porter, U.S. Senator J.P. Talaferro, and W.S. Ware at Julian Church were blazing. The flames, in the meantime, have converted into smoking piles of ashes, the thickly built portion of Ashley Street between Cedar and Hogan. Among the many prominent citizens whose houses were burned in this neighborhood were T.T. T. Stockton, W.G. Kutumer, Mr. Peacock, Blair Burwell Jr., Cecil Wilcox, J.R. Parrott, A.W. Cockrell, and others. The vast majority of these houses, as indeed are most of the residences in Jacksonville, were frame structures. They burned like cigar boxes, like chaff, as a thundering, mighty, lurid storm wave of fire rolled to the east ever to the east, and swept the area bare. At 20 minutes past three, the Windsor Hotel was in a blaze. This great box-like building covering the entire block, bounded by Hogan, Duval, Julia, and Monroe Streets, burned with awful fury. Fortunately, all the guests had warnings and the building's upper floors were empty when the fire came. The burning of a hotel like the Windsor would ordinarily be regarded a disaster in itself, but yesterday lapsed into relative insignificance, even though alone its destruction involved a loss of $175,000. A few minutes later, the St. James Hotel, which has been closed since April 19, was a mass of flames. Although a brick structure, it too burned like tinder. By this time, in the general cataclysm of destruction, the loss of individual buildings was lost sight of. Isolated houses one and two hundred yards to the eastward were burning, and fresh nuclei of flames were being added. Still, progress was steady to the east. Twenty minutes prior to the ignition of the St. James, the writer walked east on Duval from Laura. Here and there, houses were burning. All in a moment, a blinding typhoon of smoke and dust came with overwhelming power, blowing eastward, and it was necessary for those on the street to run to escape from it. For a time, it seemed that the fierce advance was straight to the east. House after house succumbed. No effort was made to save buildings now. Everyone knew that to save any building in the track of the fury was impossible, and on and on it sped. 
Churches, public buildings, and shops were destroyed. The Congregational Church, Hogan, and Church was gone. So was the First Baptist, and the Ebenezer, Colored Methodist, and Bethel Baptist, one of the finest colored churches south. At 4.30 o'clock, St. John's Episcopal Church neighborhood was the center of the conflagration. It lived but a few minutes. The Catholic Church of the Immaculate Conception, St. Joseph's Orphanage, and the convent soon fell a prey to the devourer. Now the blaze raged along Duval and Adams, but the wind changed and the conquering blaze veered to the south. The armory was burned. In the space of a few minutes, the fire crossed blocks southward, and beautiful home after home became a torch, its light bright in the monstrous mass of red illumination. The Duval Street viaduct was on fire at five o'clock. The vacant meadow over which it passes was covered with furniture and household goods. The fires were raging all this time in the section north of Adams and east of Laura. The massy business college building became ignited on Main Street, and irresistibly the flames swept toward Bay Street. Until now, it was thought that Bay Street would escape, but the thought was vain. The terror was bending in a fatal embrace to the south. The roar and the crackle resounded as the great pinions of flame moved skyward, sending showers of cinders far into the St. John's. The Emory Auditorium was a victim. Then the Board of Trade building, the old Baldwin House, wherein the Seminole Club is located, the Metropolis Publication Building, the City Hall Building and Market, and the Hubbard Building, in turn, were burned. In the latter were great stores of dynamite, powder, and ammunition, and there was explosion after explosion, adding to the dangers that surrounded the firemen on every side. Then to Bay Street, the flames ate their way. The new Furchgott building was in a few minutes blazing, and the leap to the Gardner building, towering six stories, was easy. The heat was intolerable. Building after building on the opposite side of the street was soon a mass of flames. Night had fallen. Looking east from Hogan, Bay Street from Laura and beyond showed only the reddened scene of fire. From the windows of the commercial bank building, the serpentine tongues were shooting. It was soon a skeleton. It looked as though the whole city was doomed. It seemed that there was nothing to prevent the fire's advance westward. All the afternoon, the Western Union offices, corner Laura and Bay, were crowded with people sending messages. The Western Union force stood to their posts nobly. The young ladies of the force, cool and calm, were standing to their posts, even when the building 40 feet across the street was crumbling. From the Clyde Steamship Pier, flames could be seen west along the semicircle of the St. John's banks in the shipping. It was feared that they would creep westward, burning the dockage and entire waterfront and surrounding Bay Street buildings west of Laura wiping out the buildings between. But the fire department was making a gallant stride. Engines were placed at Hogan and Bay and playing steadily on the buildings at Laura and Bay. At about 7.30 o'clock, the wind died. It was a blessed relief. The flames had lapped up everything in their way from the Cleveland factory to the Duval Street viaduct and back to Bay Street to Laura. The flames were under control at 8.30 p.m. 